welcome to Episode 7 of the Creator Forge Podcast. Creator Forge is an educational organization dedicated to offering instructional media focused on how to prepare for work in creative fields and entertainment industries. What forges great professional artists? That's the simple question we try to answer every episode as we interview professional artists and promising young art students about what they do, how they do it, and what advice they have for anyone who wants to pursue a similar career path. I'm Jeremiah Clark. And I'm Pat Bolin. And uh, this is the second part of uh, my interview with Pat Bolin. Uh, if you haven't listened to the first part, the previous podcast, go back and listen to it now. If you have, uh, let's just jump right into the interview. Boom. So I'm just trying to remember the actual, like, exact place we ended the previous one. I had finished SCAD, and I was waiting tables and or bartending or barbacking, and I was also trying to pick up... Any kind of freelance art that I could, including murals, portraits, um, you know, drawing pictures of people's freaking cats, whatever. And I remember you saying that now. Yeah, and that's where I was. And you asked me, so obviously you ended up becoming a fully employed oh, right. artist. That, so that, how did you make that transition? Yeah, that state didn't continue, and the, yeah, or something like that. Right. Yeah. I was actually pretty happy with how I ordered a few of those things. You're a brilliant man. No, not really. But every so often, like, you know, clearly you can do school. Oh, you yeah. Know, I, was, I, was, I was happy with that statement. Yeah. So <clears throat> after that was New York. Okay. So just to back up and set the stage a little bit again, you were working in the service industry and taking whatever kind of freelance artwork you could get. And uh, obviously that, that didn't continue forever. So what happened? Well, I, I kept doing a lot of that, and Savannah was starting to feel like a black hole, mm -hmm. and I started feeling the need to, and I had a lot of great relationships there, a lot of great friendships there, and I certainly enjoyed the city. I still enjoy going to that city, but I started feeling a need to just get out of there, and so I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I ended up discovering that a friend of mine who I grew up with had become an actor and moved to New York. And I want to say it was kind of that small town grapevine. My mom ran into his mom or something like that. Mm -hmm. I had fallen out of contact with him for years prior to this. And um, and I got his telephone number from my mom, gave him a call out of the blue. And next thing you know, I was moving to New York just to make a, a long story short. And that must have been quite a quite a culture shock from Savannah, Georgia to New York City. It was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's probably an understatement. I, I don't remember if I mentioned before, I think I did a few times actually, that uh, Savannah, Georgia itself seemed like a huge city to me coming from small town Alabama. New York, of course, was far, far bigger than that. And I had always wanted to check it out because, of course, New York was in the comic books, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because most of the most of the Marvel heroes are actually based in New York City. Right, because of course, what do you do as an artist or a writer? You write what you know, you draw what you know. Right, your your own environment, and New York is where uh, the birthplace of Marvel Comics is. So I had always wanted to see the big city, and I wanted to do it while I was still young. And of course, everyone always says that you know you got to go there in order to make it in comics. At least back then, the internet and uh, the convention scene just didn't exist in the way that it does now. Neither one of them. So you didn't have the networking capabilities that you currently have. So mm -hmm. back then it was it – was, and, and I think this is true with a lot of creative industries even now that you're going to have a, a much easier time finding work in a certain industry, whether it be animation that's going to be more on the West Coast. Of course, as we've already noted, that's becoming more and more an Atlanta thing now. Yeah. But back then, comics, you wanted to be in comics. You wanted to go rub elbows with artists and, uh, and writers in the big city. So that was kind of the big reason that I went. All right. So, so I'm guessing you didn't go to New York City and immediately find a job in comics. <laughs> so what, what, what did you do? How did, how did you manage to stay in New York? Because it's not a, a cheap or easy city to live in, from what I understand. No. But, I mean, I had a skill <laughs> that translated just fine into getting a job in New York, and that is waiting tables. I did very well waiting tables in New York. It was more money than I'd ever made in my life, actually. So that part was kind of covered. 
so the waiting tables is, is helping you make ends meet, but it's, it's not obviously what you're there for. It, it's not getting you closer to your, you know, an art job necessarily. So I'm, I'm assuming that in your, the time you weren't working, I'm guessing you were, you were doing art stuff. I mean, New York's a great city for that. New York was an amazing city for that. I um, I probably developed more as an artist in in the year. It was it was almost exactly one year that I was in New York, and I probably developed more as an artist in that year than I probably had while I was in school. And I think I made clear before that it's it's not that I'm bashing on my experience at SCAD. It's just I really buckled down harder once I got out of school and realized how hard it was mm. to to get work. And I I felt like there was still a big gap in my skill set, and so. When I wasn't waiting tables or, yeah, hanging out in bars with friends that I was making in New York, I was at my drawing table in my tiny little bedroom in Jackson Heights, Queens, uh, just plugging away at my skills. I was trying to learn figure drawing better. I was trying to learn inking and I was trying to learn perspective drawing better and things like that. And New York also had a really great resource for that sort of thing that I had never really experienced before, which is just a like plethora of great bookstores where I was finding Hmm. books on these subjects that I had never seen before. And of course, again, Amazon.com didn't exist back then, so I couldn't find it on the internet. So I was spending a lot of time in those bookstores and hunting for great little gems about uh, stuff that I didn't even learn when I was in school. Okay, I I had I had immediately thought you were going to go for um, museums or something because oh yeah uh, that happened too. Um, I mean, I, bookstores I dr- is actually a bit more interesting to me because that's okay. Well, just because it, it's an unexpected answer, it's not um, not something I not something I would have thought of, but I, I guess it does make sense, especially with the time frames you're talking about. Yeah, I, I mean, I discovered the. I can't remember if it was the very first Barnes and Noble or not, but it was a huge Barnes and Noble, uh, which was I want to say in the Village. And it, it was, I spent a lot of time in there and I was just, I was looking at art, art anatomy books and again, perspective drawing books and, and drafting books and things like that. And just stuff that I had never even found anywhere else, especially not in Alabama. Hmm. But yeah, as far as like New York being a good place to do art. Yes. I mean, I was spending time in sketchbook after sketchbook on the subway, uh, in parks. I was drawing a, a huge amount in the museums, I would spend, good God, in the one year that I was in New York, I probably spent an, a total of two weeks in the Museum of Natural History drawing dinosaurs, alligators, oh, yeah. bears, I mean, you name it, it was just all there and you could look at it from various angles and, and learn learn about the shapes of, you know, the natural world, but under, under a, a comfy roof in a big, beautiful building in New York. Right. So... It, it was it was a great place to develop as an artist, but I still I still wasn't really making the contacts that I needed at first. Okay, so how did how did that develop over time? You, you say at first, so I'm assuming that it did happen. One of the the few professors that I really really respected coming out of undergrad, his name was Pat Welsh, but um, I got a phone call from him just out mm-hmm. of the blue. And he and I had stayed in touch a little bit, but it had been months and months since I talked to him. But he had found out from someone else, actually, that I was in New York. And he got in touch with me and said, hey, I know Jimmy Palmiotti, who works at Marvel Comics. And, of Hmm. course, I think I've already covered this. I think we we talked about the fact that Marvel Comics had kind of gone through a collapse. And if I didn't make it completely clear before, they went through a hell of a collapse. They had... uh, let go of something like 400 people. Uh, what, um, what time frame was this again? This was 1980, or sorry, 1998 through 1999. Okay. And Marvel in 1996, they had claimed bankruptcy and let go of a right. lot of people. And I think that they actually, oh, Lord, I can't remember the number of titles that were canceled, but it was in the hundreds. And if you think about how many people work on yeah. each title, that's a lot of people. And so Marvel was in the process of just kind of hanging on at that point and trying to reinvent itself. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Palmiotti was working with Joe Casada, who eventually became the uh, editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. So that's how important they eventually became to Marvel. But at the time, Jimmy and, and Joe Casada were working at the penthouse at Marvel. The pen, uh, Marvel had just kind of given them and a few assistants and so forth the run of the penthouse just to come up with what ended up being Marvel Knights, which a lot of the stories that they came up with 
kind of reinvigorated Marvel long term and partly made them into the juggernaut that they became again. Mm-hmm. Pat put me in touch with Jimmy. I called Jimmy. Jimmy, Penthouse and Marvel. Jimmy Palmiotti picks up the phone. Hmm. And I talked to him and I said, hey, this is Pat uh, Bolin. Pat Welch sent me. Do you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, and He's like, oh, yeah, he's a so buddy. You, so you just cold called him? Well, I wasn't completely call, cold because uh, I think Pat Welch told him that oh, I was okay. going to be calling. But it's still. Yeah, yeah. But still, yeah, it was, it was nerve-wracking as um, a, a mid-20s guy, wet behind the ears and... and really kind of scared half to death at networking, to be honest. I mean, I just wasn't great at it. And um, and anyway, so Jimmy invited me there. Of course, starstruck, I went there with my portfolio. And But he looks at my work, and he gives me some pointers and feedback on my penciling. He really loved my inking, actually. But he said, and I quote, but my own brother is a great inker, and I don't have work for him. Mm. And so in my in my mind at the time, and, and, and mind you, I, I had gone through rejection after rejection after rejection at that point. It felt like another rejection to me at the time. But he did ask me, hey, if you if you want to keep coming up to the penthouse and just kind of hanging out and seeing what we do here some more, feel free to show up whenever. And I was just like, Ooh. holy crap. And I, I showed up a little bit more, but I, I didn't take proper advantage of it. I would have continued to take advantage of it. Believe me, I had every intention of it, even though I didn't recognize, I didn't recognize the opportunity that I had in front of me, which was if, if I never got work at all, here's this guy at the penthouse at comic or at Marvel Comics, saying, "Come hang out. I'll give you pointers." Bring me art when you when you make new art, and I'll tell you more about it. You know, I'll give you more feedback. He he kept telling me, "Come and grab some free comics off the rack." Stuff like that. I mean, wow. It was it was an opportunity, almost of a of a lifetime, and I totally looked past it. I didn't understand what I was getting there. I didn't understand what was happening. Oh. And then something else happened. So so, what did happen? Like what? <laughs> why did you not? just spend the rest of your days (laughs) hanging out in the Marvel penthouse. Like a lot of stories that either end badly or take you in another direction a little too suddenly, there was a girl. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) She was my girlfriend from Savannah, Georgia. And when I first moved to New York, her plans were to come and, and live with me in New York eventually. And there were some extenuating circumstances, just to be fair to her. Her father had a heart attack um, mm. there. You know, she felt the need to be there with her family at the time. And me being a little love struck and I had never really been in love before. I made the decision to go back to Savannah, Georgia to be with her. Ooh. Hmm. <laughs> Not sure what to say to that. Um, I don't like to regret. Because everything that I've done in the past, everything I've been in the past has made me into the person that I am now. And I'm pretty happy where I'm at now. That said, there's still a tinge of regret when I think about (laughs) having left that opportunity behind because, again, even though I wasn't being offered any kind of work or anything like that, we all know that relationships, and this is something that I don't think I understood completely back then, but relationships end up being professional contacts. Okay, so so at this point you you are back in Savannah. Was anything different or did you kind of fall right back into what you were doing in Savannah before you left? Unfortunately, the relationship lasted for all of another couple of months after I got there. And then it was it was just me. It was the same thing. I was still doing freelance work whenever I could get it, uh, which wasn't very often in the beginning when I first went back to Savannah. And I was I was able to get on as a bar manager at uh, a local chain of uh, bar restaurants right there Mm -hmm. in Savannah. And the money was actually pretty phenomenal for the Dirty South. You know, it it wasn't quite what I was making up in New York, waiting tables in Times Square. Well, yeah. Um, But it was was pretty decent money. I mean, I was doing okay. Um, So at some point I, I did what I have been ought to do in my life, which is I just kind of stop. I just kind of quit. Mm-hmm. And I I quit 
working in bars and restaurants, even though the money was actually pretty good, I just said to myself, you know what, if I, if I keep doing this, it's just going to be so easy to keep doing it because you know, that, that tip of money that you get every day working in a restaurant or bar, even as a bar manager for me, because I was also bartending as the bar manager, Mm -hmm. I was making an hourly plus, plus those tips. It, It was pretty good money. And they say, don't quit your day job, but sometimes, and I don't always recommend this, but sometimes that's exactly what you have to do in order to reach for something else, or you don't have time to reach for something else. Like, what was that next day like? Like, because that, that sounds utterly terrifying yeah. to me. Yeah, I didn't tell my roommates. I didn't tell them, although, of course, they noticed pretty quickly that I wasn't going to work. But mm. I, um, you know, I, uh, yeah, it was really scary. And, and just uh, honestly, there were some really hard financial times to follow. And, but I stuck to it. It's not that I couldn't go back and freaking, I mean, once you've waited tables or managed a bar, you can always go find another place to wait tables or manage bars. And I think in the back of my head, I, I was always mm. thinking, okay, I have that, I have that fallback if things go really far south. So you kind of, at least psychologically, had a uh, a little bit of a, maybe not a safety net, but a, a pad. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. But what I did is I, I just, like I said, I kept doing, I was doing portraits, you know, pencil portraits. I I kind of joined forces with my buddy, John Larison and his girlfriend at the time. And they were better painters than me. And I was, was an okay designer. And by this time, I had learned how to talk to people, hmm. which is something that a lot of artists especially coming right out of school, have a really hard time doing. But in New York, I learned how to talk to people. And as a matter of fact, my buddy John, when I came back from New York, said that uh, I, I seemed like a completely different person when I first came back. Hmm. I was actually more mellow when I came back from New York than when I had left. Something about that high-stress environment actually worked really well for me. And so I came out of my shell a little bit there. You kind of have to, or you're not going to make it in New York. At least that was my experience. And so when I came back to Savannah, I could talk to people. And so anyway, I joined forces with John to do murals. And so we had some real business. I, I mean, I remember several locations, including daycare centers and retail locations and things like that, and a couple of bar restaurants that actually took us up on it. And we were charging anything from $500 for something simple all the way up to $5,000 for something large. Wow. Wow. And I had just enough experience to know how to um, not only sell them on the idea that we could do it and that we would do a great job for them, but um, uh, how to structure the contracts. So yeah, uh, doing murals with John and his girlfriend was one of the many ways I was making money when I quit bars and restaurants. And I think I enjoyed doing the murals more than anything because I was actually painting and working color and actually, in some cases, designing original art to go on people's walls, whether it be landscapes or or whatever. And then I also started doing caricature. And that was kind of the start of something Mm -hmm. for me. Um, I really enjoyed it. It it forced me out of my shell in a way because what I was doing was live caricature. I got my start because... Someone found me. I, I, I can't even tell you how. This has happened a few good times in my career where someone finds me, gets in touch with me somehow or another, says, hey, so-and-so told me about you, but they, I don't even remember how. So someone gave me a call out of the blue and asked me to do 12 caricatures for, I think, a retirement present for someone who worked in their office. Hmm. And it was the first time I'd ever done anything like it in my life. And I really enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed stretching faces. I had no idea what I was doing, but I got a likeness. Okay, I was going to ask how you got into that because that is a very specific skill set. And I've <laughs> I've actually been asked to do caricatures before. Uh-huh. Uh, when I worked at UPS, somebody there found out that I was an artist. And of course, to a lot of people, they hear artist and like, oh, any art, you know, interchangeable. Right. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And um, she didn't like what I did <laughs> and never talked to me again. <laughs> I, I had done portraits, of course, and I'd been doing portraits since I was like 14, 15 years old mm-hmm. and for hire. I mean, you know, I, I was doing realistic, like pencil drawing type portraits. Uh, and then later on, I did some paintings. And then I also did like color pencil portraits. Uh, I did quite a few of those. Uh, and specifically in Savannah, I was doing a fair amount of those. And I think that that's somebody who, you know, somebody who knew somebody gave them my number who I had done a portrait for more than likely. And then they passed that on to me. Mm-hmm. And so I, 
I really enjoyed doing it, and that wasn't live. But when I when I discovered that hey, I could actually do this, I could get a likeness and make it cartoony and or somewhat exaggerated, and then I I could actually I could actually make that happen. And I knew people had done portraits and caricature down on the street on River Street in Savannah, Georgia. So I went down there one day with drawing pad and just set up and tried to do it. I mean, it was like, it was busking in essence, because you couldn't charge for it down there. You, yeah. you, could, you could suggest a donation amount or a tip amount, but you could not charge for something down there. So it's definitely the, the truest type of busking on the street. Okay. So is that how you get around, like, you know, business licenses yep. or any of that? Okay. Yep. So, a, I was going to say, you you really can't just set up on a street corner and start selling stuff. Well, you can, but you're not supposed right. to. And I've gotten, I, I've gotten around business licenses many, many times doing caricature in my life, not illegally at all. I, I was reporting my income. But I ended up doing caricature at a booth at Keller's Flea Market in Savannah, Georgia, where I would pay like 15 bucks for each day that I was there. And sometimes I'd hit $300 in a day there. Wow. It, it could get really, really good. But then after a while, you see the same faces over and over again uh, in a given month or two months. And then so I would move on and go try and find someplace else. And I ended up going down to this giant gazebo on Tybee Island, which was uh, a beautiful beach right near Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And this gazebo was, it, it literally looks like a giant gazebo that's off the boardwalk uh, at Tybee Island. And there was one guy there who owned the concession stand on the gazebo. He was the only person who had a license to be there. I just approached this guy, showed him what I could do, and asked him if he was willing to let me set up in front of his concession stand in return for a percentage of, of my take. And he was super gracious. Not only did he – he suggested that his take would be only 10 percent, which is wow. insane. That That's like unheard of. Yeah, yeah. that's. But he only wanted 10 percent, wow. and he never let me give him that 10 percent. He just – he liked the way it almost created like a carnival or circus-type atmosphere to have – someone doing something like caricature in front of his booth. And furthermore, oh. it kept people standing around his concession stand. So while they were waiting in line for me, sometimes they'd stop and get a whatever, a slushy or a hot dog or whatever. Right. So it, it ended up just being great. I worked there for most of a summer. And I think I, my biggest weekend was probably over 4th of July weekend where I made like five, $600 in two days. It was insane. I mean, I had a line the entire time along with the concession stand. People right. would go through the concession stand line, get out, and get into my line. Nice. You know? And unfortunately, it didn't last forever. That Those things dry up. And that was a, a hard lesson for, for me. But I spent a lot of time doing it. I enjoyed it a lot. And then on that same gazebo is where I met a young man who worked for a company called Fazen Arts. And Fazen Arts is a company that owns caricature booths out of Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. And then they also own a lot of booths at like Six Flags around the country, or at least they used to. And they also owned several booths in Las Vegas, Nevada. Hmm. And so I met this guy. His name was Tom. I don't remember his last name, but he was, I don't know, he was a college student who worked summers at the Six Flags here in Atlanta. D for, doing, like he was doing caricatures? He was doing caricatures. For this Sorry, okay. yeah, I should have made that clear. And, uh, and he showed me his, he was like 19 and I was in my late 20s, and he showed me his his caricature portfolio and I was just blown away and it was, it was airbrush and pencil and it was, it was just, it was like high art compared to what I was doing. Hmm. And, uh, and I, I was, I was, of course that, that really appeals to me as an artist. It's like, Oh wow, look at this. You can, you can actually make live caricature into a higher art form than what I was doing with a Sharpie and some crayons basically. And so I, I can't remember all the details, but he put me in touch with Steve Fazen, who was the uh, the owner of Fazen Arts. And I don't know, after a very little bit of correspondence, and, and I actually physically mailed him samples, because trying to send a high-res scan mm. via email at the time was almost impossible. And, you know, it was all dial-up. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, the size limits on attachments. And, yeah, this is the era of... I want to look at this picture and you have to watch one line of pixels <laughs> at a time come down because... Progressive scan JPEGs. Oof, yeah, yeah. Exactly that. And so 
I sent him that, and then via uh, telephone, he invited me to come out to Las Vegas. Now, they did not have employees. They had contractors. Mm -hmm. And they certainly did not pay moving costs for you to go anywhere. So it was an invitation to come take a seat at one of their three booths in Las Vegas. And and just to give you an idea, they had like 27 artists who worked for them and a couple Mm -hmm. of managers. And... So just like that, you a little bit of correspondence, you mail some stuff, and then you're moving to Vegas. Yeah. Another big jump. And yeah. this time, again, sold everything I had. I think I took three boxes of comic books with me and a backpack. And That's a, good. That probably hurts. And, and a cot. <laughs> to, uh, I sold everything. I sold all of my furniture and bought a plane ticket, a one-way plane ticket to Las Vegas. So that was a whole nother... That was a whole other chapter in my art life. I was there for about two, two and a half years doing caricature in Las Vegas with the airbrush and, and heavy graphite pencil. So I have to imagine that doing art in that kind of a setting and that kind of a style, I mean, you'd have to be, you'd have to get fast and comfortable with it. Or I have to imagine that's a very useful skill for an artist um, to be able to basically perform on command with somebody staring at you who has just paid you or is about to pay you. And it's expecting you to perform on command. <laughs> yeah. For me, as a commercial artist, it was very formative. I, I can definitely perform under deadline as where prior to that, I, I was not very good at performing under deadline. So would you say that's one of the most useful things you got out of that? Because, I mean, I've, I've, looked, I've read things by other people who've done caricature and have a couple books and things like that. And mm-hmm. that, it seems like that the that ability to to use your time to the best of its advantage and be able to turn on the speed when it's needed to meet deadlines is one of those things that comes out of that kind of experience. Yeah. Is that that accurate? Uh, And honestly, I I, I wouldn't elaborate specifically on what you just said because that was perfectly put, but absolutely you have to get fast when you're sitting there or people get bored, which, which happened to me, especially in the beginning, I was still very slow and I got faster and faster until I was probably, there were 27 artists, by the way, who worked at three different booths within this company. We had a wow. booth at, um, New York, New York, the Venetian, and also where I was working there at the time, which was, uh, of course, uh, the Excalibur casino. Um, so we had several booths. We had 27 artists at, at its height and I was Never the fastest, but I got to about middle to high range mm-hmm. in terms of speed. And so, yeah, I could get pretty fast. And when I when I was pushed, when somebody was saying, I got to be gone in three minutes, I could draw their freaking face in black and white in three minutes or less. And ultimately, I got even faster than that. Yeah. Uh, something else just occurred to me from what you're saying. Would this be the first uh, situation you were in, in your life where you were working with other artists who were doing the same thing? I mean, you had the school experience, mm-hmm. but now you're actually in a professional <laughs> environment with other professional artists. And yeah. I, I know for me, the first time I was in a, a that kind of a setting, that was that's shocking because it, it you know, you just you, you've never been there before. And now all of yeah. a sudden you, this whole new thing. And there's 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 wonderful things that come out of that and difficult things that come out of that, challenging things. I don't want to say bad. There's no such thing as bad because it's all learning. You're gonna learn from whatever is happening. So for example, artist ego. It was the first time I'd ever dealt with it on this level. Sure there was artist ego that you dealt with from fellow classmates while you were in school, but it was never as serious as when money was on the line, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And how good you were, how fast you were, definitely determined a little bit as to how many shifts you got and which location that they put you at at which time, which made a difference as to how busy you might be, Mm -hmm. which this was all commission-based. Which would directly impact your income. Right. So everybody's got their own ego about how fast they are, how good they are, whether or not they can handle the airbrush better than somebody else. And then there's a camaraderie that comes out of it as well. There were a couple of guys that took me under their wing from day one and tried to show me the ropes. And again, uh, I'm still in contact with a few of them and still friends with some of them to this day, years and years later, because they they, they were mentors to me and mm-hmm. and friends. And so you get to rub elbows with people who are so much better than you at something that you want to be good at and you get to learn from them. And so um, in the beginning, I would often, I, I would I would make enough money, meaning I would do enough caricature to mm-hmm. make enough money that I knew I could live for the next week or two. And then I would get up out of my seat, go hang around and, sh- you know, kind of shoulder surf 
some of the artists that I knew were who I idolized there, who were fantastic at what they did. And I got to watch them work mm. and I'd go, and then I'd go back to my seat after watching them for maybe three or four caricatures or something and saw how they handled the airbrush and something they would do would click. And then I'd go back around to the other side of the booth, hit my seat and then try and get people to sit down for me and try what, what I saw them do. And it was fantastic. Right. Right, yeah. and, that, and that is one of the main benefits, uh, and this happens with school too, but especially sure. in a professional environment, being around other artists is, at its best, it, it encourages you to improve, it gives you a, you know, access to mm -hmm. different people, different methods, different ways of doing things, and mm -hmm. hopefully pushes you to become better at what you do. Sure. The downside, as you said, was dealing with egos and, and other right. other conflicts and clashes. Some people are thin-skinned about their art, and you, you can't criticize it or, or right. critique it, and other people can't stop critiquing and criticizing, <laughs> and sometimes that's a little too much. Right. But. Just getting back to what I got creatively mm -hmm. out of that, caricature will help you, especially doing it live like that, will help you develop the ability to take a mental snapshot of something and just freaking draw. And, and instead of analyzing every little detail, you get what's commonly known as the gestalt or the whole. You have to take in the entire thing in one quick mental snapshot and just draw because you don't have time to erase and redraw and erase and redraw when you've got somebody who wants to get in and out in less than maybe five or 10 minutes, right? Yeah. You have to make those decisions quickly. And what you have to do is basically think Think of the human head or anything that you're drawing as basically a piece of clay or a balloon or something like that. And when you squeeze it in one place, it gets bigger in another and things like that. It's actually kind of a mm -hmm. weird math equation in a way. But you have to be able to do that very quickly. And you have to be able to make creative decisions very quickly. And yes, a lot of them are repetitive decisions. So uh, for those people who are thinking of um, caricature artists as oh, it's just a cartoon portrait. That's not what we were doing there. We were doing exaggerations. We were doing something more creative than what you commonly see at booths where it's just a cutesy head on a little tiny body. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that out there. And I actually have a lot of respect for people who do that because there's a certain type of difficulty there as well. But that's not, that's not what we were going for. We were going for more like Mad Magazine style caricature. And you, you have to be able to make, again, those creative decisions very quickly. And the second thing I got out of it, which even though I'd gone to art school and taken color theory, I never got great with color. And as someone who was mixing color in paint on the fly to then put into an airbrush and paint the color, the correct color of somebody's eyes or the correct color of their hair, or the correct color of their shirt or sweater or whatever, you had to be able to take a relatively small set of paints, mix them mm -hmm. very quickly and match what you see. Okay. So, so, so why did, why did that end? I, I know you've already mentioned a few times even that you were in the Navy and I know that that, that came in there somewhere. So how, how did that happen? How did you go from caricatures in casinos in Las Vegas to being in the Navy? The short answer is 9-11. I think that changed an awful lot of people's lives very mm. suddenly, and I was no exception to that rule. Las Vegas, and certainly what I was doing, was totally dependent on tourism at the time. After 9-11, tourism was not a thing for a while. It was a tough time. I think everybody knows it was a really tough time all around the country for a lot of people. And I didn't lose anybody in 9-11, so I'm not going to sit here and, and play victim of 9-11. Right, right. But but the point is that, that basically the source of your livelihood dried up, it, all, it, like overnight. It was gone. Yeah. It was it was gone. I went from thinking very... I, I did very well there. By the way, I, I never mentioned this, but I did eventually get pretty darn good and pretty darn fast. Mm -hmm. And I was making a fine living drawing funny faces and painting them in Las Vegas. I, I was thinking about buying a house. You know, uh, I, I was thinking about buying a new car. I, I mean, I was doing very well there. And I went from that to barely being able to buy a six pack in a month. You know, mm. I, I had to pay rent. I had to pay for travel expenses to and from work. I had to eat. That's, that's all I could afford, period. And I was scraping by on that and all of us were and just to give you uh, some some perspective here i at least still had a job there were so many people there were seventeen thousand people it was in the newspaper 
17,000 people lost their job on the Strip in Las Vegas the week after 9-11. It was bad, but at least because of the fact that I was a contract artist on commission, I didn't lose the job. I would just sit at an empty booth all day long and maybe draw one caricature a day in some cases. And so it was time to make another change. A- another leap, yeah. in other words. Well, yeah, that, that's that's a pretty heavy thing that, that everything just around you just died instantly, mm-hmm. you know, and oh, not literally, but I mean, figuratively, thank God, not literally there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean? Figuratively, everything around you just went away. It's clearly an upsetting thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah, so so you're saying you, know, you, you need to make another change, you need to make a leap, and obviously that was into the Navy somehow. Yeah. Well, it wasn't somehow. It's it's pretty much the common way. Despite the fact that everybody I knew there in Las Vegas kept calling me crazy, and I probably was. I'd probably gone a little off the deep end. I was I was kind of desperate. Mm-hmm. I was desperate for a change. I was desperate for stability that I hadn't been able to create for myself. And I am someone who's I'm I'm from a military town. Ozark, Alabama is right next to Fort Rucker, Alabama, which is an army post. And so I, I'd grown up around military people. My mom and dad were both military brats. Their fathers had both been in the army and Marines. So I'd been around military people my whole life. And as a matter of fact, where I'm from, the vast majority of males were virtually expected to join the military out of high school. I didn't. I was I was that different kid, you know. So here I am, desperate in Las Vegas. <laughs> There's a title to a film. Yeah. Uh, and I decided, you know what? Screw it. I'll do, at age 30, what everybody thought that I should have done when I was 19 or, or 18. And I went and I started talking to a recruiter. I, I joined the Navy. I had a degree already. Mm-hmm. But after 9-11, a lot of people were joining. And that degree was not a competitive degree to become an officer. So, oh, you went to art school? <laughs> Clearly officer material. Right. right. Yeah. So, and unfortunately, uh, I was trying to be either a photographer or an illustrator draftsman or some other so-called creative job in the military. None of that was available. Again, you know, so many people were trying to join after mm-hmm. 9-11 that, that it, you didn't exactly have your pick of everything, but there were a certain high demand jobs, a lot of them very technical. I ended up going in as an avionics technician. Through the entire thing, and there was a lot of schooling, a lot of very difficult training. You get basically like like two years worth of college in like six months in the military, Mm -hmm. and that's for real, Uh, especially for something technical like working on on the electronics on jets. And I got a lot out of it. I really enjoyed it, but it still wasn't me, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're a creative person and you're in a life or a job that isn't fulfilling that, what do you do? You work really freaking hard on what you love still. Because you keep doing art. Yeah. If I had, I, I didn't draw a lot while I was at work because you really had to focus when you're working on jets. Yeah. Um, but when I got off of work, so I, I, skipping past the training part, and then I'd go to my barracks room at night. Luckily, I had, by this time, I had a barracks room to myself. Um, mm-hmm. Once you get to a certain rank, you can Okay, often, so I'm, I'm picturing the, uh, you know, the, the boot camp scene in the movie yeah. where you've got, you know, 15, no. 20, no. 30 guys Although in a room. I actually did art in boot camp. It was hysterical. I, I drew caricatures of almost everybody in oh, my boot camp. Of course you did. Uh, and, and I also uh, painted our recruit division command flag, <laughs> which was uh, a bunch of wolves on top of uh, a heap of skulls. Uh, we called ourselves the Wolf Pack, which was silly, but whatever. Uh, I had fun, and they, they let me paint for crying out loud at boot camp. It was awesome. Um, so I would get off of work, go to my dorm-style barracks room, very mm-hmm. small, and I actually had a drawing table set up, which was non-regulation, and they didn't allow it, but they loved what I was doing in there and would let me get away with having it because they'd come in and see what I was doing and go, I'm not going to tell this guy not to do this. Cool. And so as long as I kept everything clean for inspect, because they did a weekly inspection, mm-hmm. it, it's the military. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're big on that. Yeah. And so, so they, you know, they'd come in and they'd, they'd see what I was doing and go, uh, I'm pretty sure this isn't regulation. And I, and I'd say, am I going to have to remove it? You know? And they'd go, uh, I'm going to talk to somebody about it. And then they'd never get back to me again. Or they just flat out tell me openly in front of, you mm-hmm. know, whoever was taking the notes. Because it was often like a higher... Uh, ranking person with a lower ranking person with a little clipboard. Right. And uh, and they often the higher ranking person would just look at it and go, I'm not telling you not to do this. This is awesome. Keep going. You know, they, they loved it. And so after a while, my career services uh, chief actually came to me one day and said, 
I hear you do all this art. Well, Illustrator Draftsman just opened up. How would you like to apply? Boy, would I. <laughs> and so that's what you're looking at from looking for from the start. So. Right. Right. What um what exactly did an Illustrator Draftsman do in the Navy? At that point, it was already starting to change because of computers. Mm -hmm. But my function at my first command as an illustrated draftsman, which was in Whidbey Island, Washington, was primarily to support the educational commitments of the EA-6B training command that I worked at. So I actually went from aviation as an avionics technician right back into an aviation world as an illustrated draftsman. So we had people who did training software and training booklets and training, you know, manuals and things like that. And my primary function was to supplement their training materials that they were writing with illustrations. So being somebody who could work from highly detailed plans and elevations and things like that was essential for what I did. So so now I'm picturing those um, military handbooks uh -huh. that I see and the, the drawings like, you know, the, the you know, apply pressure to the wound here, that kind of, that kind of stuff where they're, they're these very clean, simple, like nobody's really reacting very much drawings, or, or are you talking more technical documentation? More technical documentation. So it was actually normally not printed material because we were doing a lot of stuff, uh, like the, the pilots and, and the uh, Navy flight officers were mostly training on laptops by that time. So it was... Mm -hmm. It was e-learning, very early versions of, of e-learning. I mean, it, it wasn't super early because there was a lot of really cool graphics. And the people I was mostly working with were civilians. They, they were civilian contractors who were doing the programming for all the e-learning materials. Uh, civilian military contractors were slowly leaking into the way the military, not just the Navy, but the way the military was doing things. And that's one of the reasons why I ended up getting out of the Navy. But just uh, really quick before that, my time at Whidbey Island, Washington, uh, in terms of work and terms of the way I lived, it was prior to now was one of my favorite times in my life. I mean, it, it, hmm. as an adult, I, I really had a great time there. Uh, I had a great working relationship with a lot of officers and enlisted personnel there. It was just, it was great. I, I felt respected for the work that I was doing. I felt like I had a lot of creative choice in the types of things that I was doing. They Again, hmm. they'd, they'd come to me with a project and say, hey, here's what we need this project to accomplish. And then they'd let me just kind of handle it how I wanted to most of the time. Um, sometimes people would come to me and say, hey, this isn't part of your job duty, but would you mind taking the time to do a caricature of this guy who's retiring and we want to give him a retirement gift? Don't you? Heck yeah. You want me to take time out of my military day to do something fun That's like great. that? That's great. Sure, why not? And the Navy was paying me to take something called multimedia and interactive technologies uh, because they felt like uh, me being able to do web design and some web coding would actually help with the work that I was doing there which I almost mm -hmm. didn't apply at all while I was there because I finished that certificate about the time that I was getting out of the Navy. Of course. Okay, so, so if you were, it sounds like you were really enjoying yourself. You had, you had a good position there. So why did you actually leave? Getting out of the Navy was actually a pretty tough choice because I really was having a good time and I made a lot of friends and, and I felt really appreciated for the work that I was doing as an illustrated draftsman. Unfortunately, the Navy was actually consolidating all of the creative jobs and or they were farming them out to civilian contractors. And so the job that I was specifically doing that I had gotten so excited about was actually going away for all intents and purposes. Hmm. And there were a lot of options for me. I could have stayed in as an officer, but the only officer program that I was actually interested in, that was going away along with this consolidation. And it was uh, something called a limited duty officer. And so they were, there were limited duty officers for the photography world, for example, for photographer, photographer's mates is what they were called in the military or in the, in the Navy. A lot of the opportunities that I was kind of excited about in the Navy were just going away. And mm -hmm. so it was a great life for me. I don't regret any of it. I think it's still one of the best decisions I've ever made, even though it was a little later in life for me than it, than it is for some people. Um, it did me a lot of good. And so I, I felt like I had other choices on my plate, and that was either get out and go get a job doing web design or multimedia and interactive technologies, or do what I really wanted to do, which is uh, go back to school and get my master's degree so that I could teach. 
because I'd, I'd wanted to teach for a long time. And I had gotten, I didn't mention this before, but I had been really inspired by a few of the professors that I had when I was an undergrad who were just super energetic, inspiring people who really reached me. And I, I, that was an inspiration to me to want to teach myself. Okay. So it was specifically a desire to teach because yes. when you're listing these out, I was wondering, why didn't you go to Seattle? Because that seems right. to be your pattern. Go to another city. You right. Know? Well, Seattle was only around the corner for, from where I was stationed uh, at my last duty station, which was in Whidbey Island, Washington. Oh, okay. um, and so that was only like an hour and 30 minutes away. It wasn't a big leap for me to want to go to uh, Seattle. And I had friends there and I enjoyed Seattle. I love Seattle. I miss Seattle. Uh, it's one of the few places that I've still thought I might want to live again someday. Mm. But but yeah, I wanted to teach. Some people might call me a sucker for trying it again because SCAD the first time, even though, uh, like I said, I do feel like it was worth it. The sequential art department was not great when I went in the 90s in Savannah, Georgia. Mm-hmm. But I had a friend, my buddy John Larrison, who's still teaching in the sequential art department in Savannah, Georgia now, He had been telling me for years about the massive improvements that the department had undergone. It had grown by leaps and bounds, and they had a lot of uh, professionals who were coming to visit all the time and professors who were also former professionals and or current working professionals. And he was just telling me a lot about how great the department had become. And here was the kicker. He told me that the sequential art department was opening a branch at the Atlanta campus. And, of course... Anyone who's been listening to our podcast now knows that there was a sequential art department, SCAD Atlanta, because, of course, we covered that quite a bit uh, in Darnell's interview. Yeah. And he and I were both at the sequential art department Mm -hmm. there together. He was going for undergrad. I was going for grad school. And um, so there you go. I I got starstruck with the idea of of another degree in storytelling art, sequential art, and... I wanted to hone my skills some more. I still felt like I, I needed some more. And I wanted to be able to to teach on the college level when I got done with that. Right. I'm still not entirely clear. Why, why did it being in Atlanta appeal to you? It almost seems like that would have been... Well, the, the sequential art department in Savannah was new when you went there, which is one of the reasons it had you know some of your issues you had with it. Well, the sequential art department in Atlanta was new when you went there, <laughs> so it seems like yes. you're just you're just asking for a, uh, a history to repeat well, itself. Well, I, I did actually go and visit the campus, and I actually spoke to Sean Crystal, the chairman of the department, and I started to get you know I I, I got a picture of what the department was like. Yes, it was mm-hmm. smallish, but it was already three or four times bigger than the same department was in the '90s when I left SCAD, and. Uh, in 2007, I knew that Atlanta had a growing creative community and that it had a growing creative industry going on. So yeah, yeah Savannah yeah. still doesn't. I mean, a lot of the people who stay there end up creating their own work, which more power to them. But that's, Sa- a, that's a tough way to go, though. Savannah, even though it had a more uh, developed program already, I, I felt like the professors that I was meeting over in Atlanta... And plus the fact that it was in Atlanta was a good reason to Mm -hmm. go to the Atlanta campus. And I think I was right. I I got a a heck of an education that time out. The the department did not disappoint. So so going back for that second time, it was worth it. My God, was it worth it to me? And now I'm going to be saddled with some... I mean, okay, let me make this clear. I went back with the GI Bill. But most people think, oh, yeah, GI Bill, it's going to be... No, it doesn't pay for everything. It pays for a lot. It paid for all of my living expenses while I was going to grad school. For the, mm. th- the three years I went to grad school, I, I took a slower option. You could take a two-year or a three-year option. Right. I chose to actually take a longer option because for the first time ever, I knew that I would actually be able to, even though I was doing some freelance to make a little extra money... I knew that I would be able to actually focus on school and not have a full-time job while I was in school. Mm -hmm. And that was a first for me. And I wanted that opportunity and I wanted it for the the long option. So I went for a three-year option. And I really buckled down and worked incredibly hard while I was in grad school. And I don't regret that at all. I don't have any regrets whatsoever about going to SCAD in Atlanta for my graduate degree. I think it's all honestly going to take a completely separate podcast to talk about everything that I got out of it the second time out. Mm -hmm. 
I got fantastic instruction from a couple of really passionate, fantastic teachers who made me think about art, about storytelling, about the medium of comics in new ways. And I, this is something I'd been focusing on and thinking about my entire life. I had all the books, mm -hmm. but just rubbing elbows with so many really passionate, so many intelligent, creative people made all the difference. And, and of course, I was a TA a couple of times, so I, I helped teach classes while I was a graduate student. The, the undergrad students, so many of them were so hyper-talented, so on the ball and so intelligent that I learned a lot from them as well as from my fellow grad students and the professors. It was, it, it's an almost cult-like experience, or it was at the time there. But, I've heard that from multiple people. Yeah, but it was in, in some way, and some people actually say that about SCAD and SCAD Atlanta in a negative way. I say that in a very positive way because these are people who are so dedicated and, and so talented that they push each other. That's where the cult-like part comes in. Mm -hmm. You're constantly getting a push, not just from your professors, but from each other. And I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I was in, you know, the, the computer lab on the Cintiqs till six o'clock in the morning with 13 other students who were doing the same thing as me, because that's how dedicated they were. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that environment and you're passionate about it yourself, you cannot help but to grow. Yeah. So I had a great experience at, at SCAD Atl in Atlanta. Okay, so so here's the forty thousand dollar question: Did you find work this time? <laughs> oh God, how, how much? What was the number you just threw out? Oh, forty thousand oh, dollar question. Keep going. <laughs> Is, isn't that the forty thousand dollar pyramid or whatever their game show? Or? Oh, <laughs> I was thinking in terms of student loan debt, but <laughs> oh God, yeah, no, that's not even close. Yeah, I, that question of whether or not it was worth it to me, it was, and it, it's 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 all. It's all in how you look at it. In terms of did I find work this time out? Yeah, I, I got work right away. I had comic book work and freelance, like corporate freelance illustration lined up. And then also prior to finishing my master's thesis, I already had work lined up as a foundations professor at the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia. So it's interesting. I didn't want to go back to Savannah, but I, I did actually end up going back to Savannah for one quarter. It was fall quarter for 2010. So when it, like literally as soon as I got done in August, getting all my sign-offs in 2010 for my master's thesis and graduated, I think I didn't even have my diploma yet when I was, yeah, I was officially graduated, but I didn't actually physically have my diploma yet when I started teaching in Savannah, Georgia in the foundations department. And I was teaching drawing and 2D design, like two sections of drawing and one section of 2D design. So I was actually a part-time adjunct professor, but I was working full-time. And then I was also working full-time as a freelance artist at the same time. Hmm. And, uh, and my girlfriend, now wife, Renee... She was here in Atlanta during that time frame working her first job in the children's apparel industry, mm -hmm. doing the design work for it. Uh, she and I met in grad school, by the way. I don't, I don't think I mentioned that before. So you really did get a lot out of uh, grad school. <laughs> yeah, 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 I did. Okay, so let's back up a little bit because there's, there's two different things you were doing when you got out of school. There was freelance, which, of course, you were doing from before. And then there was a the teaching. Uh, let, let's take them one at a time. We'll start with the teaching. What was <laughs> what was that like? Because I know that was one of the reasons you initially went back to grad school in the first place. So if, if you had to narrow it down and pick something, what, what, what did you enjoy the most about teaching? I really enjoyed doing the demos. That and creating or crafting lesson plans, it, it pushed me to learn a topic more deeply than I even already knew it. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, after working so hard in grad school, a lot of these topics were very, very imprinted on the back of my brain. But everybody's heard that adage that if you really want to learn something deeply, then then teach it. Yeah. I found that to be 100% true. Um, but I was teaching for a total of like a year and a half in the foundations department there at SCAD. And then eventually I came back to Atlanta and taught at the Art Institute in Atlanta in Decatur, and then also a couple of quarters at SCAD in Atlanta in the animation department, actually, teaching concept art, basically, for, for animation. Yep. And, uh, and I also taught in the game art and animation department at the Art Institute, as well as the foundation department. So each of the classes I taught, I taught anywhere between three all the way up to seven or eight times. Um, but I really enjoyed tweaking my lesson plans, improving them, and then most importantly, 
is I enjoyed serving hungry young students who really wanted to be there and to deliver the best possible learning experience that I could. That was, I mean, I was trying to serve people like me when I was first in school. Mm Mm-hmm. I was so hungry for the knowledge. I wanted it so bad. And the knowledge was not easily available. A lot of that same knowledge is super available now, even online, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't then. And so being in front of a classroom, I did my best to serve not just everybody there as individuals, but also there's that kind of inner child, inner artist child of of mine who I was trying to serve as well. And I met quite a few people who were kindred spirits. Mm-hmm. Along those lines, who were really hungry people. There, there had to be parts of it you you didn't like because I mean that's true of any job, of course. The thing that that probably got under my skin the most when I was teaching was the times that I failed miserably at the very thing that I loved the most, which was trying to reach uh, students and delivering good instruction. Because when you're new at something, you suck at it, even if you know the information perfectly well. There is an art form to teaching a human being something. And I, of course, in, in the fir- especially in the first few quarters, I wasn't great at it. Um, but then, unfortunately, it wasn't just the first few quarters. In my last quarter teaching, I also failed miserably. And it was because I was really struggling to keep up with basically full-time teaching, even though I was, I was always a part-time or adjunct instructor, I was always teaching, you know, three classes per quarter. That almost never stopped, which was great. Mm-hmm. And then I was also pretty much freelancing full-time as well. Right. And so I was up till often four o'clock in the morning and then coming in and teaching a class at eight in the morning. And do you think I was honestly delivering the best lesson that I possibly could at eight, eight in the morning when I got, you know, three hours of sleep the night before, then showered and, and came to work? I felt terrible about splitting my attention between the two things that I love the most, because honestly, when I first went into teaching, I felt like keeping a regular practice as a professional artist would only enhance my students' experience in a classroom, which to an extent, I do believe that. Yeah, but that, that's that's tough, though. I mean, burning the candle at both ends, so to speak. and Right. And I mean... And then both things that you're... Boy putting all your heart and soul into end up suffering. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I did full-time work while I was a student, but having literally two jobs, that, that's rough. Um, but that's a good place to talk about what kind of freelance work were you doing at that time? <laughs> right. what, what was it right. that was that was crushing you at night and making it so hard for you to, to keep up during the day? I wasn't doing comics anymore. I had not been doing comics since really only about six months, I think, out of grad school. Okay, what what happened to the comics? I mean, that was that was your whole thing early on. This is kind of a tough question. The the simplest answer to it is that comics takes an enormous amount of work, and I was I mean, I would think by now after listening to all this, you know, I'm not afraid of the work. I'm not mm-hmm. afraid of the long hours. Hell, you and I are putting a lot of long hours into what we're doing right now on top right. of our full time work. But doing comics was then taking time away from things that were actually making me very decent money. Unfortunately, the struggle between commerce, you know, the need to make a living, and my desire to create, uh, it was tough. And and the first couple of projects that I had doing comics out of school, I was actually sacrificing a lot of my own creative vision as well. So it's like, okay, if I'm not either A, going to love the work that I'm doing, Mm -hmm. or B, make a fair living off of it, or worse, if I'm not going to do either one, which I I wasn't, when you're first starting out in comics, you make a pittance if you're lucky. Yeah. And I didn't lose my passion for it, but I did stop doing it professionally. And I still continue to do some comics for myself, but I switched gears and I was doing a lot of corporate stuff. That is one of those those things that um, a lot of people get a little uh, starry eyed about art and creative professions in general. The, mm-hmm. You know, but there are there are real world considerations yeah. of having to support yourself and how you you have a limited amount of time and energy. There has to be a balance there. Yeah, and and I'm not done with comics. I mean, the the truth mm-hmm. is, I still envision myself maybe doing covers, maybe doing some smaller. Like, you know, again, like 12 pagers here and there, just some fill-in stuff. I, I'm not done with comics completely just because I'm still passionate about it. I love the format. I love the medium. I love telling a story. But ultimately, 
I had some pretty massive bills to pay and I couldn't, I, I mean, honestly, I couldn't pass up on, on some of the money I was doing on corporate mm-hmm. illustration. And then that is when I got the offer for the job that I currently have. And simultaneously, my wife and I were signing on the house that we are now sitting in making this podcast. And right. it was a fixer upper. <laughs> so the the promise of steady income won out, especially with with the push and pull between my professional life and my freelance life that was already happening, and I was already mm-hmm. feeling like something needed to break there. And then I got the opportunity to get a full time studio position that was a nine to five, and then of course my wife and I getting a house. It it all felt like I needed to make a yet another big change, but this time in the direction of absolute stability. And to me, the logical choice was to cut freelance and teaching out for a time and focus on the new, the new job in, in, in an industry that certainly demanded my attention. And I was learning a lot there, which is great as we've discussed already. But then of course I I had a fixer upper house, which was going to be a huge project. And so I went from having basically two full-time jobs to two different full-time jobs. It couldn't be. Right. So for the last almost five years now, I haven't taught and I've only done a minimal amount of freelance work. Um, The house has mostly been renovated at this point. Uh, We still have to finish the bathrooms and stuff, and Mm -hmm. that's going to happen probably this coming year. But I won't be handling all of that like I have before. I've done an enormous amount of the physical labor on the house that we're in, and we we gutted parts of the house. So it was just a whole lot. And and ultimately, it's just like you were saying before, the the reality of adult life sometimes uh, comes crashing in, and you have to just say, okay, which parts are the most important? Because there's only X amount of time in Mm -hmm. my life. Okay, so uh, I think that pretty much brings us back up to the present where we started. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any last pieces of advice or um, you know things you would tell people who, who are trying to get into art careers or, or anything like that? Yeah, I have a few pieces. Don't give up just because people say you can't make it. I say that's 100% untrue. Also, you never know when something you're doing is going to be worthwhile. If you really enjoy doing a piece of art or learning a new piece of software or learning how to make video for that matter or a freaking podcast, if you feel like you can make the time, pursue it, enjoy it. You just never know when it's going to be worthwhile. A lot of my freelance work came from clients finding me on the internet and just kind of cold contacting me. So I heard somebody say this before, um, and it was during an interview with some of the employees of Blizzard Entertainment, and they said, do cool stuff and put it on the internet. <laughs> you know? And so I, I, really, I really love that quote, and I believe that 100%. So if you, if you want more work that's the kind of work that you enjoy doing, then do stuff you enjoy and put it out there because then people are going to know you for doing that sort of work, right. and they're going to pursue you to do that sort of work for them. So do cool stuff, put it on the internet, uh, there and and furthermore, even if it's not to receive a job of some kind or another, maybe it's to find an audience like what we're doing with this podcast. So you never know uh, if if you enjoy doing something that seems a little ludicrous, do it anyway. Put it out there. There's an audience for anything. Go find yours. Last thing, and this is probably the most important thing to me, is never stop learning and working on your craft. Wow, I think that's a really good note to end on. All right, so that was our interview. Uh, thanks for, for sitting down to do this, Pat. I, I know it took us a while to get to it, but hopefully after you've listened to both of these episodes, you can have some idea of why. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I think both my interview of you and now yours of me have been the most challenging, and we expected them to be the easiest. It's just... Uh, we did at least, each of them, each of us, at least twice before we got something usable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just you get nervous when it's about you, you know? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm more nervous on the mic anyway than you are. But then as soon as, soon as I'm trying to talk about myself, it just, it goes out the window. <laughs> and uh, you have the opposite problem. You are very good at talking about yourself. No, I'm not because I <laughs> I go on these mad tangents, which hopefully uh, anybody who's listening to this is not aware of those mad tangents that I have a tendency to go on because 
we cut them out. <laughs> the magic of editing. <laughs> the magic of editing. Yes, we do edit these podcasts. We have to because typically, whether it be with one of us or with one of our interviewees, we typically sit at the mic for about two and a half hours. And we don't push that. It just kind of goes in that direction. Yeah, and, and no one wants to sit through all that no. and all the all the starts and stops and all the, oh, wait, no, I said that wrong. And yeah, you know, yeah that yeah. stuff. So. so this has been uh, a heck of a learning experience and kind of an interesting walk down memory lane. Yeah. And um, since since you're the subject, I'll say it this time, uh, go, go check out Pat's website. All the links will be in the show notes. <laughs> I think that's it. Thanks for listening. All right. Join us on the last Monday in January for episode 7G, Creative Forge Geek Talk, a geeky discussion about the Marvel Cinematic Universe on TV. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you find podcasts. You can follow Creative Forge on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and just about everywhere else on the web. Feel free to leave us comments and feedback at any of those locations. We would love to hear your thoughts and suggestions. If you enjoy our show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. This will help us cover the many costs associated with creating a podcast, like equipment, hosting fees, and much, much more. Also, we will occasionally release additional podcast material that will only be available on Patreon. Thank you for your support, and thank you for listening. Thank you.